Welcome back to the Global News Relay. You're watching a newscast produced by students at 17 universities in 10 countries. I'm Eliza Navarro. And I'm Katie Gogo. The theme of this year's Relay is shelter. For this segment, we turn our attention to Hong Kong. The Homeless World Cup Foundation says 40% of the people in Hong Kong live in subsidized housing. About 100,000 people live in what's called coffin homes, cage homes, and on rooftops. The biggest problems in Hong Kong is finding affordable housing. Here's more from students at Hong Kong Baptist University. Hello everyone, and welcome to Hong Kong Baptist University. She's Gatchen Lee and I'm Michelle Yin. Here in Hong Kong, we have some of the most expensive real estates and a large income gap. Government figures here show that the Gini coefficient in Hong Kong, a measure of income distribution, is 0.5, much higher than the 0.2, a level that would suggest equality. So we are a city that has to deal with homelessness as well as homes that are so tiny that you can barely turn around in. Here's Rachel Yao to tell us more. We take a look at the living conditions of families who live in so-called subdivided flats. These are apartments split into several units. According to the Census and Statistics Department, nearly 210,000 people live in such homes. Many of these units are located in old residential buildings, some of them are in disused factory buildings where spaces are illegally boarded up to provide homes that are less than 48 square feet, roughly the size of a car parking space. Miss Chen is a single mother of two young children. They live in a subdivided unit in Hong Kong on the same floor with 14 other families. That means one apartment is split into many different units. Every day, she has to cook, clean, and navigate her way around this 110 square feet space. She pays the equivalent of about 750 US dollars for a home that is approximately the size of a minivan. Expensive and cramped living conditions are common in Hong Kong. There is also a very long queue for government housing. 其實如果以我們接觸開的街坊普遍他們都要等六七年的我們都聽過最誇張的其實十幾年都有政府之前說的可能三年上樓或者平均四年其實體現實狀況我們是見不到有街坊是這個時段上是上到樓On top of that, tenants of subdivided units constantly face the threat of eviction. These banners are the pleas for help. Uh, 
前两天都报警，他现在又追我们班。本来八户，八户他们四户都是一个人一个人的都搬走了，我们就是有家庭的没办。Wang Yun Tat is a local counselor who has been helping people living in these tiny homes. 政府面，政府一方面要真係要執法，佢又唔可以真係完全視而不見咁樣樣，即係有僭建物，或者真係知道有嗰個喺工廠大樓劏房存在，係違反咗嗰個擁土，其實埋有個真係潛在危險噶嘛。咁但係一方面亦都明白到，即係其實佢哋冇一個其他啲更好嘅選擇，可能佢會更差，因為如果誒喺度即係做唔到嘅話，可能就住唔到嘅話，可能就會搬去可能更平即係租或者係啲更危險嘅地方。咁呢個係一個處於我哋成日都係講兩難嘅情況。Subdivided homes which damage the building structure or are in violation of land use regulations may be removed by the government. In order to qualify for resettlement, tenants need to file a writ in court to prove that they are homeless as a result of government demolition. That can take time, and some may end up on the streets. 希望早点分公屋给我最好。Hong Kong is a city of migrants. Most people here are descendants of those who have fled from mainland China due to war, political, or economic reasons. But today, refugees here are struggling to survive. Ellie Wu and her team looked into the lives of those who are seeking asylum here. To qualify as a refugee, asylum seekers will well need to be assessed by the United Nations High Commission for Refugees. They decide whether people have valid reasons to claim that their lives are under threat, should they return home. In 2015, only 37% per of asylum, asylum seekers gained refugee status. But in Hong Kong, only 2 out of 100 cases were identified as a refugees. And simply waiting to be assessed can take years. Shero, which is not her real name, is an asylum seeker from Indonesia. She has been waiting for an immigration permit for four years. She lives in a 50 square feet subdivided unit with her two-year-old son. In my country, Sumatra, Lampung, we have fighting. It's because of religion. All my family run away from our country. Then um, I choose to run go to Hong Kong and work. And after that, I'm not finishing contract with my employer, then I'm cooking and cooking. I'm very afraid with, uh, with my son's future. And in Indonesia, they're making uh, sickness from drug and just they're just selling for, for our kids in school. Cheryl is one of more than 5,800 asylum seekers in Hong Kong, according to government figures. Seekers can go through the unified screening mechanism. A screening process with the government here to see if he or she is entitled to non refoulement protection. That is the right not to be sent home, for example, because they may face torture or inhumane punishment. The food coupon for me and for my child is enough. But sometimes we need more like um, vitamins. The government of um, Hong Kong don't allow us to work. I need to work because my son, for transport station, for the food, for the house rent, he's very correct. But we, we think that we, don't, we are not good enough, but we don't have any choice. The problem is that who is executing this? Honestly speaking, a lot of these immigration officers, they don't have an international perspective. Without the real knowledge of understanding these countries, there's no way you can, you can assess fairly what's going on. They're controlled by people who have plans to get rid of these people. A kind of what we call a lump or a cancer. But Hong Kong has not always been that unwelcoming of those desperate for a safe place to stay. This is, after all, a city built by migrants, many of whom fled mainland China when communism swept across the country in 1949. They sought refugee here in what used to be a British colony. And such are the roots of many local families here today. Then, 
When the Vietnam War ended in 1975, more than 200,000 refugees came to Hong Kong by boat. But Hong Kong is one of the few developed places in the world that has not signed up to the United Nations Refugees Convention. That means the city has no obligation to take in those in seeking refuge. So, for asylum seekers like Cheryl, life in Hong Kong is like stuck between a rock and a hard place. Financial scheme or the humanitarian uh, uh, scheme is really a disaster. We are providing these people with $1,200 of food coupon, $1,500 of rental assistance, and some other allowance uh, for transportation. One can hardly find a place to stay with that amount of money, and that the food coupon uh, value is certainly not enough. You allow these people to have conditional work rights. It's like say, if you have been here for more than three or four years, you should be allowed to work. And there are lots of jobs that are not, that no local Hong Kong people want to work in. I don't want his future to be dead because of my fault. If only for me, I don't need, because I'm old already. Uh, for my son, yeah, some, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's only like that. If they can allow him to be Hong Kong people, I'm very happy. It's only his future. People from the Philippines make up the biggest foreign national population here in Hong Kong. Most of them are women who work here as domestic helpers. There are now 350,000 domestic helpers in the city some of them from Indonesia, Thailand and Vietnam, and some live in inhumane conditions. Here's Rachel Yao with the story. Last year, 9% of Hong Kong's workforce were foreign domestic helpers. By law, domestic helpers have to live in their employers' homes. And often, this means no escape from work. Some are forced to sleep in cramped spaces or work for prolonged hours without food. The exact figure of these victimized helpers is not known. Migrant workers group tell us that some would choose to remain silent in order to keep their jobs. Sunday in Central, Victoria Park, Causeway Bay in Hong Kong. This is where some of the city's 352,000 domestic helpers, which is 9% of overall workforce, spend their days off. Under the government's live-in rule, these women, most of them from the Philippines and Indonesia, must live at the homes of their employers. So, on their days off, there is nowhere to go but to sit on the streets. The live-in rule was introduced in April 2003, was supposed to prevent workers from overseas competing with local people for jobs. The majority of people who support mandatory live-in believe that um, Workers will work part-time even like when they finish working in the employer's home mm -hmm. and some might think that um, like they cannot control what they do in the, in the city or in the society uh, when, when they live out. But spending 24-7 with their employers leave domestic helpers vulnerable to abuse. <laughs> It means that it's very, very difficult to regulate how much they work because the domestic help is not going to say if somebody comes in at 2 a.m. in the morning and wants something to eat or whatever it is, she's not going to say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not on call. Even if they are allowed to live out, Many of their helpers probably cannot afford to. Most of them earn the minimum wage of just over 500 US dollars a month. The average cost of renting a 450 square feet flat is equivalent to 2,025 US dollars per month. Under their contracts, employers of domestic helpers are supposed to provide decent living conditions. Such working conditions take a toll on the health of the helpers. In 2016, right. over 100 foreign domestic workers died in Hong Kong 
and majority of them it's uh, died from illnesses, but those are stress related. They might call the agency for help. Usually the message they get from the agency is go back to your employer, be obedient and do as she says and you'll be fine. Three years ago, the horrific beating of one Indonesia helper, Ariana, by her employer shocked Hong Kong. Her employer is now serving six years in jail and Ariana won 103,000 US dollars in damages. Workers' rights group have campaigned for the scraping of the live-in rule. Nancy Lubiano, a Filipino domestic helper, lost her judicial review earlier this year. A government spokesman said publicly two years ago that there is no shortage of local people who are willing to take on domestic worker jobs. So there is no sign of change on the live-in rule for these women anytime soon. An estimated number of 1,800 people in Hong Kong are homeless, according to government data. Some of them work, but simply cannot make ends meet. Our reporter Amy Ho has more. The government here in Hong Kong wants a number of shelters for homeless people. When we started working on this story, we were wondering why people choose to live rough rather than go to these shelters. We found out that staying at a shelter is often not convenient and sometimes unsafe. We then found out that some would pay the price of a cup of coffee to spend their life somewhere you do not quite expect. It is the middle of the night and people are snoozing. But this is not an airport terminal or a train station. This is in fact the 24-hour McDonald's in the impoverished district of Sam Shui Po, where some of Hong Kong homeless people seek shelter every night. Kong Hong Man is one of them. More than 900 people were homeless at the end of 2016, according to government figures. That's nearly two and a half times as many as 10 years ago. They can choose to sleep in government-run centers like this one, but social worker Clarence Y says few people choose to do so. Some of those who end up on walkways like Shan and other street sleeper actually prefer this to a government shelter. A lot of homeless shelters have serious hygiene problems. Yomate Shelter, under Street Sleeper Shelter Society Trustee Incorporated, is built above the public toilet and a garbage station. There is an indecent smell of urine and cockroaches and mosquitoes breed in holes around in this area. And even finding a good spot outside isn't easy. Park benches are often designed such that they are uncomfortable to sleep on. Like I hope we have helped you to understand some of the problems with homelessness and shelters here in Hong Kong. We hope to join you again next year on Global News Relay. Goodbye, Goodbye from, from Hong, Hong Kong. Kong.
Michelle N. and Catherine Lee join us live from Hong Kong. Hello, how are you guys doing today? Hi. 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 Good evening from Hong Kong. <laughs> oh, good evening for you guys. Good morning yes, for good us. <laughs> yeah. Good morning to you. So we're, uh, we, we're more understanding of your program that you're in now, but we want to know how it is as a young reporter in this program to get to cover stories like this for GNR. Um, as young reporters, to get a cover story, this has been a very um, interesting experience for us to explore shelter, the problems that we see in our own city. So overall, it's a very immersive experience. We got to look at subdivided units, refugee problems, and, um, and also domestic worker problems in Hong Kong. And some of these things we never knew before, and some of these people's lives we also never looked into before. Because we go about the city and we don't notice these people sometimes. So that is, this has been a very valuable experience for us. Do you feel like it was something you kind of expected when you went, even though you said you lived in the city and you really didn't know about that, when you went, when you learned more about it and started working on your story, were you shocked more than what you thought you were going to be when you were working on these stories? Well, actually, we sort of expected uh, the situation of the people who are living there. For example, for these subdivided units, we sort of expected that the situation of their um, living condition would be pretty bad. But then when we actually went there and talked to the people and get to know about their stories ourselves, it's really shocking to learn about uh, the, sto the stories of these people and also for other stories as well. So, yeah, it's a really nice experience for us. Right, so we, um, we're curious to know how it is for you guys as students. If you don't have the opportunity to live with your parents during college, um, how does that housing process work? How do you get the funding for that? Um, if, we don't live, um, if we don't live with our parents, um, you need funding for this project, right? Well, funding for this, for this project, um, our school has been very supportive in this process. We get to borrow equipment our teachers also act as very excellent mentor to us and basically guide us through this process. Yeah, and well, transportation in Hong Kong is not very inconvenient. Hong Kong is not exactly like a very huge place. So transportation has been rather easy. We get easy access to equipment and places. And even though our schedule can get quite busy because we're journalists of students, but we still find the time to do what we love, which is to shoot these videos and to edit them. And how much does it cost to live in Hong Kong? The uh, living cost in Hong Kong is actually quite high. Like, I don't have the statistics with me right now, but then you can see, like, for example, for instance, especially for the shelter for a uh, living, is very pricey in Hong Kong. So um, I would say it's not easy to live in a decent, uh, with a decent place in Hong Kong. It's very uh, costly. Um, for example, uh, we have quoted uh, some statistics in our video before. Uh, for a flat, uh, which is about like 80 square, me uh, square feet, it actually costs about um, 5,000 Hong Kong dollars a month. So that's uh, roughly um, maybe like half of the uh, half of the wage, the minimum wage. So if you're living off a minimum wage, you can't really live off a very decent uh, space in Hong Kong. Right, so um, back to how it is as students. Uh, we have something at Fresno State called the Student Cupboard where you can go and all you, all you do is swipe your ID card and they give you a whole basket of groceries. Do you guys have anything like that um, for your school? Um, in our, in our, inside our school, yes, Student Card does bring us many benefits. Like inside our school, we have the school canteen, which gives discount to students. All the coffee shops in our schools also give discount to students. And the halls in our school, even though it's, it, um, it's pretty small, but then it's still a decent place for us to live. And the halls are definitely nowhere near as, as expensive as the normal house we would rent outside. And Hong Kong in general provides lots of benefit for students. For example, like discount off transportation public transportation as in our um, metro and our bus and also if we go to buy certain stationaries or in certain certain more student friendly stores if we show our student card we will still get a discount that's neat right it's kind of the same with us if you live in the dorms you get to swipe your id card and they give you they give you mm -hmm. a little amount to go yeah. um, get stuff from 
fast food and places that we have on campus. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So it's a, it's a little similar. So that's good that you guys get some support out there as well. Thank you. It was really nice to talk with you guys. I hope you guys have yeah. a good rest of your evening evening over there. Yes, yes. Yeah. Nice talking to you too. Yeah, thank Bye. you. We've been talking with Michelle and, and Catherine Lee from Hong Kong Baptist University. You're watching the Global News Relay, a collaborative global newscast created by university students around the world. The GNR stream live on CMAC.TV, our Fresno State Focus and Global News Relay YouTube channels, and on our website, globalnewsrelay.com. We're also live tweeting and posting on Instagram, Facebook, and Snapchat. You can find links to all of our social media platforms on our GNR website and Global News Relay Facebook page. We're going to hand the GNR baton to Bobby Fallett and Lindsay Hyatt, and they're going to take you from Indonesia to India and Bulgaria. They'll be joined by our Global News Relay partners from Ryerson University in Toronto, Canada. Here are some of the stories you'll see in the next hour. Plus, a botanical garden in Jakarta that houses rare plants. And from the Asian College of Journalism. Hi, I'm Akira Nambiar and I will be representing the Asian College of Journalism as a reporter for the Global News Relay 2018. My story will be on the night shelters for transgenders in Chennai. So stay tuned for the story. Welcome back to the Global News Relay. We're streaming live. Hi everyone, this is Michelle. I'm a year free student at Hong Kong Baptist University. I am an international journalism major student and I would like to show you what it's like to study here. So this is the room where we have most of our broadcast lessons. We learn how to write, shoot and produce stories and also it's pretty fun when we have a bunch of students working on story together. Over here is the studio itself where my classmates and I produce a new show some of us work with the cameras, some in the control room, and it's kind of nerve-wracking when it's your turn to do the anchoring. The script appears on that other cue on a camera, so it looks like you're talking to the audience when you read off the prompter. Our professors are pretty open for us to make any kind of program, so we've done talk shows, breaking news shows, and live shots. And let me show you where we do radio. So this is the radio console, and in there, there's the studio. We put on headphones so we can communicate with the producers outside. Find out more about us on www.comm.hkbu.edu.hk. 